Okay, welcome back everybody. Here we are with the latest update. We've got the wing tanks installed, butt ribs are up. So we had to custom fit every single one so that they fit up against here and made the right profile. Um, they've been riveted and high sawed in place along with this attach angle for the windshield, but they're pretty much good to go. Uh, I've heard from another person building this kit that he doesn't put these in place finally until fabric uh, is finished. So I'm gonna wait on those. They did have to be trimmed back here so this clears on the top of the doubler and then the bolt could come in and out. Also on the front, I had to trim both the angle and the wood to get the bolts and pins in and out. So that was just trimming. These took a lot longer than, well, everything takes a lot longer, but these took a lot longer than you would think. We just, I guess, fiddled around with them for longer than we needed to. But they're up, not permanently, but up until, up for now until we can get a uh, covering on and then it'll be fit and shaped in place. I did end up taking some of the bearings out of the rudder pedals to try and reduce some of the resistance and it didn't help at all that we worked on today a little bit. There's a little resistance on the far throw. Uh, it doesn't overcome the spring tension. So I'm not really sure what else to do. We've sanded everything down as much as we can. And uh, at this point, I don't know if it's even a problem. I think I might just have standards that are too high, but we've done everything we can to get them to move. I've just decided that this rudder pedal design is not optimal. It's so hard to get just right. And I feel like there's a way of designing maybe a tube that's welded into the frame that makes sure that the rudder pedal's aligned. When the actual firewall goes on, I'll refit re everything in and rig it and see if it still has resistance in that position that I'm worried about. And if it still does, then I'll pull everything out and continue to stand. But in the position that I think they'll be installed, there's no problem, so I might leave it. This column, I torqued it exactly to spec and it still has resistance. So this is another one of those things I'm gonna have to go back and shim or sand. I don't even know what to do at this point. I've sanded it for four hours at this, at this point, I think it's been four hours of sanding by three different people and it still has resistance. So maybe that's how it's supposed to be. I don't know. Um, I'll try and shim it again. That's another, one of those last things I can try to see if it will fix the problem. But for now, it's, it's just one of those big mystery items that I'm gonna try and tackle tomorrow. So we'll see, we'll see what that ends up panning out to be. That's pretty much it for the front. And we've got the wheels on dollies. So we can actually move it side to side really easily. Uh, and the tail wheel shifts as well with it pretty easily. So this setup makes it easy to get in and out of the shop. I still don't have my rod ends. They shipped on Monday, which was a few days ago. And allegedly they're going to be delivered on Saturday, which is just shipping right now is so slow. I've got five or six packages en route that I've ordered, some of them more than two weeks ago. And here in Montana, everything's just taking forever to be delivered. So here we have the wing tanks. Pretty straightforward install, but a lot of work. These had to be cleaned first. We had to wash them out with an acetone and a fuel mixture. So we washed those. It said a minimum of three times and it shouldn't need to have a fourth but we ended up doing an extra one because there was still a tiny bit of fiberglass particles coming out of the, uh, what do you call it, uh, finger screen when we filtered it out. So we did that, that took basically a day because you have to wash them and then let it dry and then wash them and then let it dry and then wash them and let it dry. Do that four times. We got those cleaned out. I did have the thread sealant that I thought I was missing. It wasn't on the builder tool list, but I went through my builder box and I found the Permatex Permaseal, I think is what it's called. It's the ethanol resistant uh, threading sealer. And I had that in the builder's toolkit, but it wasn't on their list. So I have another one ordered in the mail. Who knows when it's gonna be here? Everything's taking forever. But I did have that and all these fittings are in, have been tapped with the appropriate taps. That's not something they tell you you need until you get to that part in the manual. These are some pretty specialty pipe taps that you don't have in your typical tap and die set. So I found them 
at Ace Hardware at the recommendation of another Kitfox builder who has a YouTube channel. So I got, got those set up and had an issue with those. I will show you what that issue was. So this spacing here is different than what I would have initially expected for a couple reasons. One, the STI wing is taller. And so I'll just point up there, with the standard wing, the fabric and the ribs would sit flush with the, uh, they'd sit flush next to each other. So the fabric would sit right on top of the fuel tank. With the STI wing, as you can see, the ribs are gonna sit on top of higher than the fuel tank. So the fabric will never actually touch the fuel tank. That actually makes fuel tank installation a little bit easier because you don't have to have as nice of an edge. You can, you can straighten it out, but it doesn't have to be a clean spacing between the ribs because you have all this play between the two. So I had thought, well, if that's the case, then I can slide these back and forth in here and you won't even see the gap in spacing. And I thought to myself, where am I gonna position them at that point? So I initially wanted to position them as far inboard as possible to move the weight of these things as close to the actual spar attach points as I could. I ran into an issue. This fitting, which I'll take the tape off, this fitting is different than the one in the manual. And it causes actually problems that I didn't realize until after I had finalized it. I actually went back and looked and it didn't seem right. And it turns out it isn't right. The fitting that they normally supply is much shorter. So the actual bulk of the elbow is, it only protrudes from the finger screen about, an, I don't know, maybe a, an inch or so. And this one's maybe two inches of, it, of clearance out from the finger screen. That causes problems because this finger screen needs to be inspected and cleaned every once in a while. If you had a standard wing, this fitting would not work. But because I have an STI wing, I was able to shift the fuel tank really far outboard and leave enough space so you can unscrew this and inspect it at some later point in time. But ideally, this would have been appropriately spaced inboard and I wouldn't have issues unscrewing this if I did had to inspect it. Um, as you can see, it, it won't clear, the, it barely clears the cap strip. I mean, there's, there's enough to get maybe three or four turns to get it out of there, so I've actually tested it. So it does, it is removable, so I can inspect it. That's not a problem. And worst case scenario, I can cut a notch in this cap strip to get it in and out. But this, I don't know why they sent me this one. In the manual, it's a different looking one. It's the right part number, but it's, not, it wouldn't work for a non-STI wing, and maybe they did send this just for the STI wing, but I was able to make it work by sliding that tank all the way to the far outboard and getting it to work. But still, a little bit of a confusion. On that note, because that fitting had to be moved far outboard, this tank is sitting flush up against the number three rib, and there's no gap. In fact, if you were to try and look down from the top, you couldn't see from the top cap strip uh, uh, all the way down to the bottom of the tank. So that's, that hole's filled. I was just reading the checklist in the manual, and it says to verify that you have enough space to fit a needle through here all the way to the bottom for ridge stitching. Didn't say that in the manual, but it said it in the pre-covering check checklist. So I'm glad I caught it. What I'm gonna do is cut a little notch here wherever the rib stitchings go, I think it's here, and in the back so that I can get a rib needle through. It'll be really hard because I have to thread it right through that hole, but at least I caught that and was able to resolve that problem. It wouldn't have been a problem had they sent the smaller elbow valve, but that's what I got, so that's what I'm dealing with. If you look up on top, there is the fuel tank from the top view. You can see the fuel filler cap. It's all taped in place, but that actually protects the fuel caps from flowing onto the wing, and it also raises this up so that the fabric will sit on top of this instead of onto the tank. Otherwise, the fuel cap would be recessed quite substantially. I also had to glue all these false ribs on this number two rib, which is like a weird shaped rib that has no center in it and we got that shaped and put in place and then the false ribs on the bottom which they say oh cut to fit that 
false rib job right here took, <laughs> I actually don't have a bandsaw, so what I did was I tur turned a really, really high powered rotary sander and just ground them all down. I taped six of them together side by side and then ground them all down to shape so they matched. So they have to be the same profile and match the bottom of the wing, but they were all shaped individually to fit the contour. So that's six per side, so it's 12 custom fit false ribs. If I had a bandsaw, this would have gone along a lot faster, but I don't have a bandsaw. You can see this white coating on the front. This is called epoxy primer. I did put three coats on the leading edge spars for both the left and the right wing. I'm planning on putting the leading edge on the front of this. And once I do that, I won't have access to this spar to put epoxy primer on it. So I figured I'd start by doing the thing that I won't have access to, and then I can epoxy prime the inside and the rear spar even after that leading edge is put on. But once that leading edge is put on, it'll be really hard to access this. You may be able to get around there, but you won't be able to get a good coat. What epoxy primer does is seals the aluminum from moisture and salt water is the big one. If you live near the coast or you have a seaplane or you're just in a humid environment, this will keep moisture from the aluminum. Aluminum will corrode. It, it's pretty nasty, it turns white. It's kind of hard to detect and it's pretty, it's pretty uh, gnarly. And you don't want it to corrode on your structural components. So this spar is an aluminum spar. And if it were to corrode, you'd start losing structural integrity of the spar. Kitfox says it's optional to put primer on if you live in human environments or you're gonna operate in a corrosive environment, as they say. But I think everybody should do this because you don't know where your plane's gonna go or where you're gonna store it in its entire life. And if you sell it to somebody, they might live on the coast or they might want to put it on floats. And if this hasn't been done yet, they're gonna have to rip the whole fabric off and have the spars recoated, which would be a lot of work for no reason. So. Everybody who has any aluminum aircraft should protect it from corrosion because it's such an easy thing to do when it's off and it doesn't really add that much weight and it will dramatically improve the uh, longevity of the aluminum. So the way you do the epoxy primer according to the manual on the inside, because how, how are you gonna get a brush in there? Well, you can't, so <laughs> they say to clean it out with rubbing alcohol, not rubbing alcohol, de denatured alcohol, by putting a tennis ball in the end and plugging it and then just sloshing it around in there and then doing the same thing with the paint. You put the paint in and then you just slosh it around in the tube. Uh, you have to do it three times to get three coats. But that's what I'm planning on doing to get these guys sealed also on the inside. This took pretty much all day. It's pretty tedious. It is a spray gun. It's primarily a spray gun application but it goes on really well with a brush. You don't thin it as much or else it runs a lot. And the first coat that goes on, it doesn't look like it's really covering. The second coat, you start seeing some productivity. And then the third coat, it looks really nice. It's like an enamel almost, and you can't see any aluminum through there. I also went ahead and primed the stringers and the other aluminum support tubes in the plane where I couldn't access them. It's probably overkill, but it doesn't hurt. I had the primer out. It was an extra maybe hour of priming or two per wing. And it's just gonna add, add peace of mind and added protection to the whole integrity of the airframe. I painted these while it was attached to the plane and folded. And I kind of regret doing that. It made it much more difficult to access everything. It would have been easier had I taken this whole thing off, put it in a rotisserie and painted it that way. I would have been able to get both sides at the same time and I wouldn't have made as much of a mess. Okay, so after installing the wing tank, I glued, of course, the ribs and the stringers, and then this little aluminum tube, which actually is a drain that goes out of the back of the filler neck and drains all the way to the rear number two rib and comes out of the, the plane that way. So this allows fuel to overflow from the tank filler neck if you were to spill it next to the filler neck, and it won't pool in the in that actual cup, it'll drain out of here. I'm still gonna trim these, but I left them long just to get them through. These trailing edges, which are identical to the rest of the trailing edges in the plane, 
get installed in, they have to be notched and then riveted in the middle and just glued, high sawed in place along the whole back of the plane. The header tank we did actually permanently mount into the plane. It's, it's solid and bolted in place. I did have that thread sealant, as I mentioned. It wasn't on the builder's list, but I had it in the kit. Just didn't know. I'd seen it before, and I finally found it eventually. We did get it mounted. One of the things that I had mentioned before is that this seatbelt tab didn't fit, but I never really showed you how that was a problem. So this tab has to mount to that tab. And you can see that it's really close to the edge of the header tank. So if this was flat like the other ones, this is the center mounting bracket. This is the outboard mounting bracket. If it was flat, it wouldn't fit next to the header tank. So I bent this one in a vise. So I should add this to the build list. A vise is something that you have to have for this. I guess you could do it with pliers, but I'd be kind of nervous. This is what the factory, factory recommended to do as I bent that tab just a tiny bit. And it's gonna bolt on top instead of on bottom, which would make, it, it's not gonna make any difference in the integrity of the seatbelt, but it'll allow it to fit and swing. And that way I don't have to bend it much more because I don't, I bent it a little bit and I don't really wanna bend it any more than I already have. So that is solved. Uh, one of those, here's an example of one of the silly issues that you deal with for building a kit. You have to customize, customize and custom fit everything. Here's a quick shot of the baggage compartment. I did temporarily put it in place. The floorboards are down there. What I have to do is drill back from the frame down on the bottom. You see there's those tabs right there that mount into the bottom of the floorboards. And then I'll take it out and this will be, I think it'll be out for covering, but I haven't really checked that in the manual. But it's a pretty neat baggage space. It's got these side pockets that are Velcroed that are really handy. It's got those on the other side as well. It's got these little side pouches. You can put stuff up here, I guess headsets, because the headset jack will be somewhere on the side here. And then the little loop for the flapper on horn, which comes out from the top. It'll go out of the turtle deck. So I'm pretty happy with that. I can extend it all the way, but I'm not going to. So this is, this is the extended baggage compartment option. The normal baggage compartment option would be pretty small. I mean, think, think it would just stop at this bar. This is 48 inches long. You could fit a human in there. Would the human be happy? Probably not, but a human would fit <laughs> in this baggage compartment. Another note, I tried to install the dual pin door latch. I was gonna do that before I mounted the doors. And I opened the box and looked for instructions. There are 26 individual different parts, 26 different types of parts, but many more than that. I think it's 100 parts for the silly door latch. And it weighs a ton. And it gives you no additional advantage other than keeping the door latched if you're doing aerobatics or something crazy. So I thought to myself, why did I even get this dual pinch door latch in the first place? I had thought that it allowed you to have a second position on the door so that you could crack the doors. That is incorrect. The dual pin door latch only is an additionally secure item. In fact, it's no longer an option on the Kitfox STI order form, although they might be putting it back. And there are no instructions in the manual. You have to email them for instructions. I actually am gonna put a PDF of the instructions up on my website so that it's up there forever. I'll put a link on the forum too so people can find it. But it's still in the Skystar header. So the Kitfox has not even changed the logo from Skystar to Kitfox. It's just the old Skystar dual pin door latch instructions. I don't know why they've done that, but I thought that was pretty frustrating that the I felt like a little deceived as to what it was and I just ordered the option and fortunately they've been helpful and I am sending it back for credit and they're gonna send me the smaller door pin option or the standard door pin option. So if I had to order again, I would not order the dual pin door latch. In fact, I am not using the dual pin door latch. It, it has no purpose unless you're doing aerobatics. And so what I wanted was the ability to crack this door because I was gonna add eyeball vents but then I realized this has really easy to open doors and I can get airflow that way as long as I can crack it. And I had heard that there was this way of getting the doors to crack. Well, that's with the standard hinge and latch. You can notch the actual tab 
so that it has a second position. So it is a custom option, as everything seems to be, but it isn't any fancy add-on. It's just the standard latch with a notch. That actually also brings me to another point, which is the tow transport kit, which is a kit that allows you to fold the wings like this, and you have these lock back braces that hold the wings from swinging. They tie it back to the vertical stabilizer, as well as this pad that goes on top of the rudder so that your flaperons don't hit the rudder in transport. This has kind of instructions, but it also refers to a specific set of instructions that don't exist. So I'm gonna email and see if I can get instructions. There's no way to get these tabs to line up with any of the existing holes, and I feel like I'm gonna have to customize them. And they're also painted in ugly yellow. I, f I would have imagined they would be matched to the color of my powder coat, but they're not. I think they're just sort of a stock option. But there is no apparent way of making this work just out of the box. So it's another thing I think I'm gonna have to custom fit, which is kind of annoying. I would have rather just made some myself. But the pad is really nice. It's, it's really well made. The pad that actually protects, protects the rudder, I'll actually pull that out. This is actually the pad that protects the flaperons and trailing edge from bumping into the vertical stabilizer and rudder when you transport it. I had a question about whether or not I need to trim my aluminum tubes, and it's something I gotta do more research on, but these don't fold back exactly the same distance from the or a vertical stabilizer, it's pretty obvious, you can see it. I mean, this one's way closer than that one to the actual vertical stabilizer. And there's a notch up there that um, I may need to file down. These won't sit this close because the flaperons will keep it off, but I don't think the weight should be sitting on the aluminum spars up at the top. It should be sitting on the bolts and then the struts and maybe these lockback braces. So this has a notch. Right there, you can see it notched out so that this bar will not run into the, or the spar won't run into the bar when you do fold it. But as you can see, it's making contact with this carry-through spar. And I don't know if it's supposed to do that. I think the notch is supposed to clear it and it's supposed to come all the way around and touch some other way. But I've got to ask that question. In fact, I'll ask the factory tomorrow what, what their thoughts are on that. Because I can trim this out or file it out so that it doesn't, sit right on this back end. But uh, these are the factory cut holes, so I would assume they would do it right from the factory, but I could be wrong with that. The tow transport kit is kind of a mystery still. Some of the pieces are cool, but these lockback braces are still at this moment are useless to me because they don't work out of the box. So uh, that's one I'm gonna have to look into. I definitely, I'm glad that I bought that pad because when I do go to fold these things, it's going to be nice. So I think the kit in itself is going to be great if I can get these things to work, but no instructions and going to have to be custom fit, I'm guessing. That's all for now. Progress might uh, come to a screeching halt here for a couple months because uh, I might be heading out to work. I wasn't actually supposed to be working on this now. I'm supposed to be working, but because of COVID, I had plenty of time to work on it, which I've gotten it basically finished and ready to cover, uh, minus the few parts that I'm missing. But for now, this is the latest update. Maybe get one more in before I go, but if not, see you guys in a couple months.